Hello. Happy Monday. Welcome to the National Parents Union Nightly Restorative Check-In. I am your host, Marisol Quevedo Rerucha. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for being with me um, on uh, this evening. I am from San Diego, California, and as always, I introduce myself by introducing my family. So I am, again, Marisol Quevedo Rerucha. I am the daughter to Irma Navran. I am the mother to Camerina, Emilia, and Sofia. I am the granddaughter of Camerina, Alejandro, Francisco, and Carmen. And I'm the grandmother to Isabella Luna and Cynthia Eliana. I'm also the wife to Daniel and the niece to Yolanda and the sister to Alex, Atia, and Cameron. So uh, it's always so important to me and I just, I. I so important to me to introduce myself in this way because it grounds me and it reminds me that I am here not just to speak and share with you, but that also, you know, it reminds me that what my voice represents and who I represent. And I don't walk in this world alone. Um, and I've never walked in this world in this world alone. This journey has always been a part of our family's journey and also the journey of those that have poured love, wisdom, and challenge into us. So it's with a lot of honor that I introduce myself to you in that way. Um, welcome. And we always start our show with a um, restorative breathing technique. And this technique has shown to really immediately bring you to a space of calm and peace and just to get us grounded and focused. Um, so this, this breathing technique was taught to me doc, Dr. Ang, by Dr. Anjali, sorry, and she hosts our show on Friday. So she will, um, I will be with you on Wednesday and she will be with you this coming Friday. So let's go ahead and get started. This is the four, seven, eight breathing technique. We inhale for four seconds, we hold for seven, and then we release for eight. And we do this four different times. So I will guide by counting down the numbers to help you if at any, at any point um, something feels too long, just go to your regular breathing and then join us. And again, so we're gonna do four seconds inhale, seven seconds hold, eight second release. And we do this for uh, this pattern four different times. Okay, so let's get started. I always prefer to have my feet planted firmly on the ground because again, I feel like this grounds me and it connects me to the earth. Put my hands gently on my lap. If you'd like to either lower or close your eyes, take a breath out. And inhale, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven, release, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, inhale, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven, release, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, inhale, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven, release, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, inhale, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven, release, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Thank you for joining me as a reminder. You can do that technique anytime. The recommendation is at least once a day. Um, but if you know, it's, it's very hot in our country right now. So if you're having a hard time falling asleep, um, doing the technique can help. If you're just even feeling foggy brain from the heat like I do, um, you can try this technique and help get you into a more peaceful, um, peaceful space. So I know it also, I love doing it before the show because it just helps me Again, connect and feel grounded and ready for the conversation that we're going to have. So with that, I would like to introduce to you our guest for tonight, Tafshir Crosby. 
And Tashir is one of the delegates from the National Parents Union. She also has her own Facebook live show here on Facebook through the Parents Union. And, um, oh, here she is. Okay. Hi, Tashir. I just need you to unmute yourself. <laughs> you would think I would know how to do this by now. <laughs> so I am so happy to be with you tonight. And again, so I, um, as I mentioned, I get a little uh, hazy in the heat. It's been really hot. So if I, um, if I act loopy, I apologize. I don't drink, wow. I don't do drugs, I don't do anything. <laughs> So Tashmir, could you please um, introduce yourself to our audience, just share who you are, um, what you love in life, what you're passionate about, what you do, anything that you would like to share about yourself, about your family, whatever you would like to share. Okay, so I'm going to take a cue from yourself with actually naming names. Um, my kids may not like this. So I'm going to put your name out here tonight, people. So I am mother to Tahir, Naasia, and Nadir. I am wife to Raheem. I am grandmother to Morgan and Alexis and Noah, my babies. And I am sister to Rashana, oh, Stevan, Rashana, and Kahira. So that, that is like my small extended family. I have a, a lot larger family on both sides, but those are like the, the, the small connected group of us. Um, I'm from New Jersey. I'm from Newark, New Jersey. I'm a native Newarker, born and raised. Um, I'm a city girl. You know, I always thought that maybe someday I would move to the country, to the South or to the Midwest, but I'm a city girl. I love my city. I love living in the city. I love everything about the city. I love the people. I love the food, I love the connection, the culture, the community. So there's no other place that I would rather be in the world than in Newark, New Jersey. So the work that I do, uh, I wear a bunch of different hats. <laughs> it's funny, anytime I go into a space and people see me there, the first question they always ask me is like, who are you with today? They're like, what, what hat are you wearing today? Because like, I'm part of so many different organizations. But I feel like the work that I do still stays grounded in the same premise of parent engagement and parent empowerment, right? So like, I feel like I'm at the center and the things that I do kind of revolve around me, but it's all in the same vein of parent engagement, parent empowerment. I have been a parent for 30 years um, and I work, my, my organization, Parent Impact with my good friend, Jamila Muhammad, we work towards making sure that families have resources to be partners and leaders in their children's education, right? All too often we see that parents are semi-engaged in schools, but it's really only when schools want them to be engaged. We wanna make sure that parents are really creating partnerships with schools and really leading out here in the streets, learning how to be leaders, leading themselves, leading their families, leading other parents. Um, and I really, on the Parent Impact show that's on NPU Live, I work towards talking to community members in Newark and throughout the state of New Jersey, people who are leading the charge, people who are first, you know, Black people in, in the spaces that they're in, people who are really pushing the envelope when it comes to parent empowerment, parent engagement, using their voices, uh, using their voices for change, and really making sure that they are being the, the change that they want to see. In, in the world. So this is my passion. It has been my passion for a very long time, even when I worked in the corporate America for a very long <laughs> time. Like my heart and my mind and my soul was always in working with families. And I love working with children. I love to make sure that children have opportunities that they're entitled to, you know, civil rights that they're entitled to, and making sure that children have opportunities to grow and learn as they get older. Um, and, and really be able to make their families proud. You know, I tell my kids, you can't live with me forever. Like, you just can't. So you need to figure out something to do with yourself, um, whether it be college or working or whatever. I just want to make sure that they are proud of themselves at the end of the day and that I did my job as, as a mom. What was the impetus for you becoming involved in the parent engagement work? So for me, I always say it's nature and nurture. Um, my mom was always involved in our school. 
She was in PTA. She came to every concert we ever did. She was, we lived across the street from the school. We lived across the street. We lived down the street first, and then we lived across the street from the school. So, like, she was always there. She was a stay-at-home mom, but she was a hustler. You know, this was the 80s, so she did jerry curls. She sold pocketbooks, watches, you know, whatever it was that she needed to do. She moved us out of the city of Newark and into the city of Orange, which is a, a suburb, to have to give us a better life, to give us an opportunity to live in a house, to have better education. But she was always, always the very first advocate that I saw for, for myself and my sisters. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a couple of um, stories I tell this story before, you know, two times I can, I can, I can really remember where she advocated for me. I was a, a teen mom, I was pregnant at 16, and the school would not let me go on school trips because they would insure me, but not my unborn child. She fought to make sure that that happened so I can go on school trips with my family, with my, my uh, classmates. The school wanted me to go to a school for pregnant girls. Pregnant girls, pregnant teenagers, like teenagers are already like, you know, like, and then pregnant at the same time, there was no way I was doing that. And the school was low performing, right? I was in a, a gifted and talented school. There was no way I was going to that low performing school. So she advocated for me to stay in the school, to make sure that I graduated on time, to stay with my class. So for me, it was really just a matter of having seen my mother be so involved in my community and in my schooling and, you know, helping me and making sure that I got good grades and that I was focused and it, it just spilled over. You know, once I started having kids, it wasn't really a question of whether I would be involved. Um, the question was how much I would be involved, right? Would, would I be a, a smother, which I am. I'm a self-professed smother. My kids know it and I don't care. <laughs> Self-professed, I am a smother. I'm not a helicopter, but I'm a smother, even to this day, even to my grown kids. Sorry, kids. <laughs> and so, so this is something I, I, I'm really excited to talk to you about because I don't think I quite realize this. Um, and, and because it is one of the most phenomenal experiences of my life, um, and that's being a grandmother. Yes. So I would please tell me about your grandbabies and how has, has your smothering transferred to grand smothering? <laughs> grand smothering. <laughs> um, they are so, so, so sweet. I have two grand girls and a grand boy and they are just the, the, the sweetest babies. I, every time I think about them, I, they just make me smile. I don't get to see them as often as I would like, especially during COVID. You know, I don't want anything to happen to them. I don't want them really to be out, to be um, exposed to anything. Um, my smothering has not extended to them. And that's mainly because they don't live in my city. I know for a fact mm. that if they lived in my city, I definitely would be a, grand a grandmother. I would be all over them. But they definitely... Uh, I give them liberties that I didn't give to my own children, right? They're allowed to like have crumbs all over the living room and like jump all over the couch and they, they come in. I have like an area in my living room where they just come in and just throw all the toys on the floor. Like they just take all the buckets and just like dump all the toys on the floor. Like with my kids, I would have been like, pick that up. Like, what are you doing? Play with um, one toy. <laughs> one one toy. One toy. Like, don't throw oh, yeah. all the toys out. So they, they definitely take a lot of liberties where my my uh, children did not have those same liberties. But they are they are part of my heart. They're so sweet. They they're just they're just such sweet babies. Um, you know, they they when I see them, they're all happy. They call me Nona. So they're like, hey, Nona. How old um, are they? So they are six, four. And my grand my grandson, he'll be two in October. Okay. Although they actually run to my husband more than they run to me. When they see me, they're mm -hmm. like, hey no, no, they give me a hug and then they go on the way. Okay, he comes in the door. <laughs> they're like, pop up. They're like, oh my God. I'm just like, where where was mine? Like, where was that same energy for me? Like, where's where's Donna's energy? Um, but, but I, I love them dearly. But they, if they lived in my city, I definitely would be a mother for them. I definitely would probably drive their parents insane. <laughs> are your are your children? Are they uh, smothers and and father? I don't know what the what the father term of that would be, but are they? <laughs> do you see them? Do you see them in that same uh, that same way that you were when you were raising them? My my son, yes. It, it, these are my my oldest son's children. So absolutely, I absolutely see him you know, being an advocate for them. Um, one of their mothers is a teacher. 
so she's she's a she's an advocate mm-hmm. um and she's the, now i'm sorry Allie, but she's this mother <laughs> she's this mother the two youngest ones like their mom she's this mother um the oldest one morgan her mother she's half and half um she she has you know her days when morgan will come down because she lives in camden so morgan will come to the north and she's consistently calling my son and you know i want to talk to my daughter and i'm like your daughter's okay like she's fine she's here with us she'll be fine she's there's nothing gonna happen to her like i've successfully managed to raise three kids so i think i think she'll be okay um so she, she's she's a halfway mother uh, but i definitely see my son being like me you know making sure that he shows up for parent teacher conferences and making sure that he's showing up to the school and his presence is known and people know who he is and so, you know, he, he's definitely got the nurture and nature for me, just being at the school, being involved, letting everybody know that he's there to advocate for his children and that he, he loves his children and he wants to make sure that as a, as a dad, he wants to see them have the best education possible. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. It's definitely- and what, what more could you ask from your children, right? And for your grandbabies that hold the keys to your exactly. heart? Like- exactly. I just want them to be the best you know, to, to take take all the good things from me. <laughs> I know that's a lot to ask for. <laughs> <laughs> because, well, because there are so many good things that they can take from you. Absolutely. I mean, there are. There are. But, uh, mm-hmm. you know, that's that's a lot to ask for when you tell somebody to, to only take the good things <laughs> from you. Well, and, you know, I think the other piece in parenting um, that I've had to come to terms with is just allowing your kids to define who they are beyond you. Oh, my gosh. That was difficult for me to do with my daughter. She, she She's my middle baby. Um, how how old is she? 24, so she's not a baby anymore. Um, that was the most difficult for me with her. Um, she's very smart. She's a traveler. She is open to lots of different things, lots of different cultures, lots of different people. But I, I projected a lot of what I thought thought she should be on to her even when she was in college um and you know she finally had to say to me like let me be me like I know who you want me to be but let me be me so I I just had to kind of step back and say okay all right do you think any part of that was was maybe what you had wanted for yourself absolutely absolutely especially being a teen mom you know I didn't have an opportunity Mm. to really you know, I, I grew up with my son. Like I said, I was 16. I grew up with him. You know, people, you know, people talk about like, if you had an opportunity to do something different now, what would you do differently? I definitely would, would have traveled more when I was younger. You know, when I had him, I did travel a lot. And then I had her when I was 21, which was six years later. And then I had my last son at 27. So I definitely projected a lot of what I wanted to see in her, you know, graduate from college, get a good job, um, have that career and really just be able to write her own ticket in life. You know, I felt like, you know, while while I, I do feel good about where I am now in my life, you know, it's, it it hasn't been easy. You know, it wasn't it wasn't all roses and, you know, it it wasn't all pretty. And you know, some people think because uh, I'm I'm sometimes quiet. I shouldn't say quiet. But I'm sometimes quiet. <laughs> you know, some people think that I'm from like the suburbs or something, which is strange because I'm like I'm from like here i'm from right here where everybody else is from in, in the city of newark um so definitely i definitely projected a lot of what i wanted for my life to her life um and she she actually has done a lot of the things that i wanted to do like she lived in cyprus for three months when she was in college she gets to travel you know she doesn't have any children so like she's free she's free to just get up and you know go where she needs to go and that's definitely something that that i missed I think it's so, it's such a life thing, but that call of like, because you have struggled, right? And life was not easy and wanting to protect your kids from that. But I think there's that realization um, at some point, hopefully that we all have, that the struggle is what makes us who we are. And that because of life being what it is, like everybody has challenges, everybody is going to struggle and and not just struggle, but like that heartbreaking, gut-wrenching, you know, because we're human beings and this is what life is. I think we just want to protect our kids from that. But I think the, you know, the more that we can talk about it and hopefully start to change that paradigm a little bit so that we could be seen 
more as like supports and potentially guides for our kids or, or advice from a from a very obviously loving um but but a little bit more of an objective space where they don't feel judgment or they don't feel where they, but they still, there's the connection to be able to provide them the guidance and support because when they fall, which they will, and they will fall willingly. <laughs> they will. <laughs> you know, like they, they will, they will. They will. I, I always say you're, you're going to be like, there's the burning building, stay away. And they'll be like, woo, burning oh, building. Woo. And you're like, I, I said it. I, I said it. I always tell my friend, I have a friend of mine who we talk about our kids. Um, they're, they're not too far apart. She has three. They're not too far apart in age, a lot of them. Um, and I always tell her, like, your children will listen to you the second time you say something. Like, they don't listen to you the first time. It's always the second time you say something or well, when someone else says somebody it. Somebody else says it. <laughs> Or when somebody else says it, every time, every time, every time. Like, I just said that. Like, I'll say it and somebody, else, oh, let me tell you, mom, what such and such said to me. And I'm like, oh, okay. All right. I just said that last week, but okay. Go go for it. <laughs> so you know what, what, it surprises me because um, with my own children, and I'm wondering what, what it would be for you. But I, um, there were things that I really wanted to model for my kids. There were things that I really, and I was a young mom. I was not 16. I was 19. There, uh, the amount of change between 16 and 19 is tremendous. Yeah. Um, but I, I was a young mom and I had my second daughter at 21. So they were 14, 15 months apart. Um, but um, so there were things that I absolutely, like the lessons or things that I, I was hoping that they would take away from me. And yeah. um there was one that I really wasn't expecting. And that was, I'm grateful for it. But one of the things that I've seen in my kids is really, they don't lie. And, and, and related to that is they absolutely take responsibility for, for themselves and for their actions. Awesome. And, and I'm very, I'm very proud of that, but it surprised me that that was kind of the takeaway. Right. Um, that, that I'm seeing right now at the point of lies that they're at. Like, Marina's 26 and Emilia's 25. But you know what I will say that they will, if they do something wrong or if they do something, if they mess up, they own it. And, you know, even as teenagers, there was a little work that we had to do through that. Um, and I, like, and I'm down with that. It just really, it, it, it was surprising to me now, you know, and in, in having a different type of relationship with them as they've gotten older. Right. you know they're grown adults that that is that's what came through yeah um so i'm wondering for you if if anything like that has popped up where you thought like you were doing this and then kind of this other surprising piece came through <clears throat> i think um it, it wasn't surprising but like for my family we're very open and honest with each other you know mm -hmm. almost to the point of like our kids are, are sometimes like y'all just don't care like y'all just gonna say the truth like whatever the truth is you're just gonna say it so i think it wasn't a surprise that they are all that way um but they are all that way not even just my kids like my sister's kids like when we're all together like we just say the truth to each other you know we we don't sugarcoat it we don't yeah. you know um dance around it we just say what it is and then we will we'll deal with whatever it is that we're saying to each other um so I, I definitely don't think that was a surprise. <laughs> I definitely think that they all got that honestly and they actually uh, execute that daily, um, even to like the chagrin of some people that they know, you know, because some people are like, you know, when they're around us, they don't, for some people who don't have that same relationship with their family members, they, they're sometimes taken aback, you know, that we're so mm -hmm. open with each other and we, we can just say what's on our mind with each other. You know, they'll say like, oh my God, like, you know, like, did your mom just say that to you? And like, and they're like, yeah, she just said that to me, you know, because that's what she wanted me to know. Um, let me think, is there anything that I'm surprised about that they do? Um, I think that, that, that what you're talking about, that honesty, it's so important. And I think what's also really important is being able to do that without being hurtful. Yes, yes. And, and, and that comes from trust, right? Because sometimes in families, they will say mean things under the guise of being honest. Right, right. But it's, but, just mean. But it's mean and hurtful. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. And yes. so that real honesty of like, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to, like you said, like, we're not going to sugarcoat. No. This is the no. way things are. But 
But that I think it, being able to deliver that in a supportive, loving way, right. that's what establishes that trust also Agreed. between family members, which I, I think is critical. It, it definitely is. You know, we, we definitely don't say anything, you know, we don't say anything to be mean. We, it's not, we're not looking at the person from a critical eye. We're not, judge, we're not judging them, you know, as our family members. We, it's yeah. coming from a place of love. It's coming from a place of, I love you enough to, to be honest with you. And I love you enough to say what I have to say. And I want you to love me enough to say what you have to say to me, yeah. you know, and just be open about it. Um, yeah, and, and it's all of them. Like, I, it's all of them. It's, it's nine of them. I have uh, uh, two sisters. I have three sisters. One of them passed away uh, two years mm -hmm. ago. And there are nine children amongst the, the four sisters. Um, and they just, they're all the same way. <laughs> like, every single one of them. We were with them this weekend, and we were just like, oh, my gosh. So many. And there were, so there were no brothers. It was just three sisters. It was three sisters, no brothers. Yeah. Four sisters, no brothers, but we ended up having more boys than girls. <laughs> so there are five boys and four girls. Um, and I have of the, the second, the next generation, there are three boys and two girls. So weirdly, we end up having more boys in our family than we started with. It was just, just the four girls. Yeah, just me and my three sisters. Your, your family is balancing out the, that energy. They're balancing it out. And I have three daughters and two granddaughters. So I thought I would get the boy through my first grandchild and that didn't happen. And okay. really after that, I was like, oh, that, you know, it's, it's all good. It's all, right. it's all good. It's all, right. <laughs> it's all good. We're all good. So it's all right. here, with your, with your babies, with your kids. So I get that you're like your mom, like really showed you. And I think there's part of almost like, you know, when you grow up, Saturday mornings, early in the morning, you're waking up and you're cleaning, right? The music is going and that's the day that the family, everybody's up out of their beds and you're cleaning. So there's just some things that you're kind of like, oh, that's the way things are. And I could see with the way that your mother was like present in school, like, like with your teachers as a partner. So I could see you being a young mom, knowing that was your role to yeah. be present, to be a partner. But the work that you've really engaged in and by starting Parent Impact, that's, that is beyond just taking care of your kids. So, so can, can you talk a little bit about that? And then also, I know that you have a, a sister who's an elected official yes. and I believe she's on the city council, but that also speaks to your family's, um, that tells me that your family really values community and mm -hmm. not just community, but the fact that there's a responsibility that we each carry to each other as members of the community. So why you say that, I'm just going to get up because my I'm on my phone and I got the low power, so I got to get the strip up, but I have my, I'm, I can hear. Okay. So you're going to, you're going to be talking to my chair for a second while I okay. charge my phone. Okay. So, so, but I'm listening, I'm right here. So for me, you know, I've always been an advocate for my kids, right? I've always advocated for them. I've always been that busybody mom, that, that big mouth mom, right knows me at the school, you know, it's like norm. Um, on Cheers, you know, I come in, they're like, hey, Miss Cosby, you know, I know all the kids, uh, a lot of teachers know me. Um, I think it wasn't until maybe my oldest son was, you know, I've always been that, that education advocate for like my nieces and nephews. I've always been like mm -hmm. the person to call when they have a question about education, when they have a question about teachers and all those things. Were you, were you the first one of your sisters to have kids? Um, no, my niece okay. is a few months older than my son. Okay. They're about, she was born in April and he was born in, she was born in January, he was born in April. So they were actually born the same year. So my oldest sister, who was four years older okay. than me, she had her, her daughter and then I had my son. So I was the second one um, to have a child. But so, that's basically right at the same time. Right at the same time. You I mean, you, it, you became moms house. at the same time. Same time, same house, you know, changing diapers with both of them, nurturing both of them. I mean, they, they literally grew up like brothers and sisters. We have, we have pairs in my family. So like my oldest son, we, we act, it's nine of them. So they're in groupings. So we have like the first three are grouped, they're closer in age. And then the middle three are grouped together. And then like the last three are grouped together. So when we talk about them, we talk about them in groupings. We're like, which grouping are you talking about? You're talking about one, two, or three. <laughs> like to, to, to signify which grouping of kids we were talking about. Because they, they're all really close in age, a year, two years apart. Um, so for me, I think helping other families to be able to advocate and help just, just being, I've always been a community person. I've always been 
out helping people, you know, doing community cleanups and going to meetings and talking to people. That's just always been my personality. I've always been that person. Everybody's always seen me out in my community, joining organizations, helping organizations. It wasn't until my son started to get a little bit older when I started to be asked at the schools to like join the parent councils, right? Like, like join the parent councils because they realized that I would be at all the school board meetings I would be all the planning meetings and I was actually helping other parents to make sense of a lot of the things that were happening at the school, um, specifically like financial. I used to work in the financial sector for a long time. So I was able to help parents understand financial sector and, and you know, really get to know other parents, really create, form, form really strong bonds with other parents. So it was when they started asking me to be on parent councils and, you know, join the, be like the PTA leader. Um, my first foray into like leadership into the school was when I started the Girl Scouts. I used to be a Girl Scout. So I was like, of course I have to be the Girl Scout leader. Like I was a Girl Scout for way longer than I really wanted to be. But my mother was like, you're going to be, you're going to be, I was a Girl Scout until I was like 14, which is like old. I was like, oh my God, like teenager, I still had like the little socks and the beanie and the, so I became the Girl Scout leader. <laughs> And then is when I really started to develop more of a leadership style with myself and learn how to be a leader for other parents, learn how to speak out for other parents, learn how to help parents, even have conversations with like the principal at the school. Because a lot of parents, you know, they're, they're still bringing trauma to school with them. And in our community, a lot of our schools are really old. So some of our parents actually, you know, went to some of these elementary, middle, and high schools themselves. But a lot of them still bring some trauma with them. A lot of them are like afraid to talk to the principal or afraid to talk to the teacher because of what they've gone through. So I was able to help families, you know, come into the meetings with them, help them find their words, just really be a helpful advocate to them when they wanted to get to what it, what it, whatever it was they needed to get through with their, with their families. Um, also be like a calming agent for some parents. You know, they come in really upset. They, they're you know, really mad and they, they really want to like rip somebody's head off. You know, it's like, wait a minute, like really find out what's really going on. Um, find out what really happened. And now let's go and have this conversation calmly. It was about 10 years ago when I was invited to the uh, Black Alliance for Educational Options. I was invited to their symposium in Memphis, Tennessee. And that was when I really got to meet advocates from across the country, um, you know, when I really thought about doing advocacy professionally, uh, it was just really, it was just something that I was always passionate about, but professionally, I was stuck in corporate America. So I was like, I, I didn't think that this was something I could actually like branch out and do or really think of as a career. So I met all the- your passion. I mean, it was like, I walked into that room and I saw those people and I was just like, my heart was just like, wow, like, wow. Like all these people, you know, advocate for families across the country and that's like their job. Like this is like their job. And I was just shocked at that. So I came back to Newark, I came back to Newark having like a renewed sense of like, I want to learn as much as I can about helping families advocate for their children learning about policy, learning about 504s, how to help a family with the 504, learning more about special education, learning more about the actual schools themselves, the structure of the schools, learning more about the school board. Um, and I just like dove into it head first. I was in the first cohort and then I actually started working with them part-time. So I actually worked full-time. I had three kids, I had a husband. I worked part-time as a community organizer um, and I was still everywhere. I was still going to like every meeting I could possibly get my body to. Um, but I think I felt like I was in training. You know, I felt like it was almost like boot camp to get me to this point mm -hmm. where I now have knowledge to be able to help other families. Um, the passion is, is, is even more, you know, the passion just burns in me to make sure that I'm helping as many families as possible. Um, and it's, it's really, the last 10 years have really been transformative for me just, just professionally and, and personally to, to, to be in this space and to work with families day after day and to see families grow and flourish and lead and, and really take charge on their, their children's education. Um, it's, it's just a great space to be in. It's a great space to be in. Although I can say that when my son was a junior in high school, 
he actually um, stopped me from over advocating for him, you know, and, and it's funny because I was like, I didn't think that was a thing. Like, I, I thought, you know, as his mother, I was doing what I was supposed to do. But he said to me, stop advocating for me. You're, you're not allowing me to advocate for myself. Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't, he recognized that he didn't know self-advocacy because I had advocated for him so much that he didn't know how to advocate for himself. Um, so that was eye-opening. And that's actually a conversation that I had with a lot of our parents. Like, you know, what's, what's the fine line between advocating for your child and then over-advocating for them to the point where they don't know how to now do self-advocacy, which is something I had to learn. From, from my own child who said like stop it. Well, and part of that is also, which is great that you have the relationship. I think that's what's most phenomenal. Is he knew that he could say that to you. Yes. And he also knew that the skill that he needed to develop. And I think that's such an important story for parents because I, and part of it, it's, that was a different experience because he's a different person yes. than what happened with you and your mom. Yes. You know, the person yes. that you are, you were able to see her you were able to see her in action. And then, and I think also because you became a mom so young, because it was, you were about the same age, right? You were about a junior in high school. Yep, I was a junior in high when, school. Yeah, so about the same age as your son saying, back up. <laughs> I got this. Like, 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 I, I need to learn how to do this for my, especially when he thought about himself in college and he, because he had a 504. You know, he thought about himself going to college, now having to advocate for himself, but he didn't know how because I had been consistently advocating for him, consistently, consistently, consistently. Um, so it was, it was just an eye opener. So for, for parents out there, you know, check, take, take a step back sometimes when you go to the school and you know, the advocating that you're doing for your child, is it over advocating, right? Does your child actually know how to advocate for themselves? And I'm not talking about elementary school students, I'm talking about maybe some high school students. Do, does your child have the tools to be able to advocate for themselves when they need to? Well, and I, I think it's very fair to say uh, elementary school students as well. Like, why, I mean, some of my greatest heroes are, you know, some of these kids that are really young and doing things to change the world, to change their neighborhood. Like you see kids that are raising monies for, um, for the homeless. They're raising monies for other kids in other countries, they're, they're doing things, they're, they're knitting caps, they're making masks. Right. So, you know, I think, I think part of that, it's, it's the, it's the doing for and doing with. Yes. So it, it was, you know, that, um, that meeting that we had that Bernita uh, Bradley, who is also a delegate, what did she say? She said, if it, it something, like if something is not done with me, yes. then it is not for, not me. for me. Exactly. If it's not done with me, then it's not for me. That's right. And I think that I think we need to adopt that when looking at, at like at, at the way that we're raising our kids. Yes. And at what point do we at what point do we include the with? Because yes. kids are freaking amazing. And I see it with my, my grandbabies. I don't know. If, <laughs> I don't know if you've experienced the brilliance. <laughs> yeah. but, but I mean, there's they're brilliant, right? Yes. They're brilliant. Uh, they just, they, really are. they need you to do things with them. I saw this little baby video on TikTok. Little baby was pouring things in to bake, but somebody was showing her and trusting her mm -hmm. how to like turn the bowl into the, I'm sure they were right there. Right. But there, there was that support. So I, 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 I don't want to say just the middle and high school kids. Yeah. Like with, with the littles also. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. It's true. And, you know, the, the question before you got up, you, you talked about my sister being um, an elected official. She's a councilwoman serving her fourth term in the city of Linden. Hey, Roshana, <laughs> we were about two years apart. Um, and, uh, you know, she, she really is, she's not a politician. She really is a community servant. Like she really is a servant of her community. She doesn't do any of the things she does for accolades. She doesn't do it for, um, to be promoted to any like higher, you know, um, office. She really genuinely cares about the community, her fifth ward community. She cares about the families who are there. She's very approachable. She's very accessible. Like she's consistently walking around her community, 
even when she's not running for election, right? She's walking around, she's talking to people, she's answering calls. They call in the middle of the night, you know, telling her like dogs are barking and like a tree has <laughs> fallen. Like she gets like some strange requests, but like people have her actual cell phone number, right? They don't have, she doesn't have an age, she doesn't have a staff. Like it's her and her city doing what she does, which is be the best possible community servant that she could possibly be. Um, and it's not just myself and my sister. You know, my cousin, she's actually um, a district leader in our city. My uncle, he was an education advocate for a very long time, for 30, almost 40 years. His name is Willie C. Rowe. He actually just had a street named after him. He passed away last year. But he was an advocate in the city for a very long time. You know, I think, I think our family just really has this. And, and my, I have, my kids have been in the community for a long time. My kids have been volunteering since they could walk. You know, it's, and it's about giving back. It's about giving back to your community, making sure that you instill that in your children at a very young age, that they, they should be giving back to their community. Like, this is where we live. You should be part of your community. You should get to know your community. You should get to know your neighbors. Um, and, and you really should, and take, take pride in the fact that you are giving of yourself for others to, to, to make sure that others um, experience the, the joy of, having you in their space and you being in their space. You know, I, my kids don't even go to shop right with me anymore because like I'm in there for like an hour and I talk to everybody. <laughs> I talk to everybody. Like I always go in there and I know somebody every time. Every time I know like two or three people and they're like, hey, Tasha. And I'm like, hey, we're in there. We're, we're chopping it up. We're kicking it up. So they're like, we can't go anywhere with you now because you know so many people and you're so embedded in the community now that, you know, I'm, and I'm always stopping to talk to people. Like, I, I'm always stopping to talk to people. Um, I'm always walking around my community talking to people. I'm always in my neighborhood. Um, we were supposed to do a community cleanup this week, actually, in my neighborhood, but I went away uh, for the weekend. So I want to make sure that we, we also get that done because we, we need to make sure we clean up this community. But well, it, it, and it, I'm glad, it in our family. I'm glad that you brought that up, that, that you went away for the weekend, because I come up, uh, from a family that's very involved in the community as well. And one of the things that, um, I, and I think it was also just from the times, right? Um, yes. They really, I think it was really my generation, our generation that is starting to learn how to take care of yourself and doing the work. Yes. Because I think really there was a lot of, you know, community and my family came first. Right. Others came first way before self and also even before your family. Yeah. And, and that, it, you know, I think there's a different, uh, there's a couple of different reasons and components like that behind that, that push that narrative, that that's what you do. But really, I think that, and thank God for Oprah, um, you know, and all the work that she's done in the last 35, 40 years. But the understanding that we really need to take care of ourselves in order to continue doing the work. So I'm so glad that you went away this weekend with your family. And what are other ways that you take care of yourself? And how are you teaching your kids how to take care of themselves? Yeah, yeah. Um, so for me, I do meditation in the morning. Um, before I get out of bed, I really give myself a few minutes just to think about my day, think about the day that I want to create, think about the energy that I want to bring into my day. Um, because I, I realized that like, if I just jump out the bed, then my day is just completely shot. Like my energy is off. I, I can't, I can't internalize what I want to make happen in my day. So I meditate in the morning. I just signed up for Shine, which is amazing. We had that conversation <laughs> about signing up for like that Shine. So it's like daily affirmations. I write in my journal. Um, I, yeah, I think they need to give me a kickback. I don't think Shine knows how much business I got that. I'm telling you, they, they, they need, need to give me a kickback. <laughs> a lot of people signed up for that on your recommendation. I'm telling you. So you I, need like a month, I need a month free of Shine. <laughs> you definitely do. And I caught them at a good time because they were having a sale. So I got like 50% off. It was like $26 for the year. And, well, like, and so which Shine is an app that was made by people of color for people of color. And it's a meditation app. But they also recently had like a whole day or two of wellness wellness. So it's, yeah. it's also, um, you know, the other thing that my sister talked to us about last Monday, so I want to just put this in your ear and I did put it on Facebook. Um, I think it's called, oh, it's a walking, it's a walking app. It's by, uh, it's by and for black women. Okay. And yeah. it's like, you take a 20 minute walk. It's, I think it's a podcast and they talk about black history, black history oh. during the walk. I love that. 
So it's on my Facebook page. It's Trek. It's, oh, I can't remember, but she shared it. Okay. So, so (laughs) I, I'll look on my Facebook page and I'll tag you. Um, but I think that that's other, uh, another great way. So sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. So okay, your meditation, I'm you're doing. I do yeah. my meditation. I do my journaling. I do my writing. Uh, I do my walking. I don't walk as much as, as I should. Um, I do my walking before when the world was still open, like my spa days were everything. Like every quarter mm. I took myself to the spa. I just relaxed. I read a book. I, you know, just, just had a chance to myself just to, just, just mentally stop all the action that was happening in my head and really be able to just sit and relax with my thoughts. I try to do that now. Um, you know, just the other day, my brain capacity was just at like a thousand. I had like five Zoom meetings. Um, I had like read a book in between. I was reading all these articles and my brain at like four o'clock was just done. It was like, you cannot take any more information. It was like information overload. Mm-hmm. I literally had to just go lay down for like an hour and just not think about anything. Just not think about anything because my brain just could not, just, it just couldn't take any more information input into it. Um, so I know when I start to feel that way, I know when I start to feel cranky, um, that I'm stressed and I need to do something to relieve that. Um, you know, I'll drink my water, I'll drink my lime water, I'll drink my lemon water, I'll go for my walk. I'm still waiting for my husband to bring my bike up from the basement, which I've been asking him to do in this whole COVID. Tomorrow I'm going to get my own dog on bike. Six months? <laughs> six months? Six months. You've been, been asking it for six months. months. <laughs> I have. I'm like, I, I, I just go, I need to go get it myself because my, my seat is on my seat. I'm going to go get my bike make, tomorrow. Make away. sure he's someplace where he can see you get it. Like, you see this, right? You see me getting my bike <laughs> out the basement and like taking it outside. <laughs> But I just, I I try to slow down. I try to slow down when I feel myself being anxious. Um, This morning, I woke up with weird anxiety. I woke up with like a pounding heart and Mm -hmm. um, acid reflux, which is something I don't normally suffer from. And I could just feel myself anxious and I literally just got out of the bed. So I was like, okay, get back in the bed, lay there for a few minutes. I did some journaling. Um, I read a few pages of a, a book that I'm reading and I just had to center myself and at, literally ask myself, like, what, what is the matter with you? Like, I, I, I find myself doing that. I'll look in the mirror and I'll literally say to myself, like, what is at the bottom of this feeling? Because I know it's not, it's not something surface. It's definitely something that's deeper inside of me that's really giving me this anxiety feeling. So I laid there for about 20 minutes, I did some breathing techniques, I felt better. Um, and then Did you figure out what it was? I, I figured out what it was. I had some projects that I hadn't done over the weekend. You know, as much as I was, we were at the beach, we took like a shore tour, as much as I was enjoying the weekend and didn't think about work, you know, it was almost like the minute I will open my eyes this morning, every, every project that I hadn't completed immediately came rushing back. It was immediate. It was just like, you gotta do this, you gotta do that, you gotta do this. And I was just like, okay. Let me stop. Let me think about, let me create the energy that I want for the day. And by the time I came downstairs, when I started to get to work, I started writing down everything that I had to do this week. I got everything prioritized. I worked on the things that I had to work Mm -hmm. on. And then I felt better. It was really my mind and my heart saying to me, you know, you have some things that are unfinished that you haven't worked on. I just didn't anticipate it manifesting like that. You know, especially mm-hmm. since I had such a great weekend. I'm like, I, the weekend was awesome. I, I rested, I relaxed. But it, it just, it manifests itself into anxiety. And I had to recognize it first. And then I had to figure out what I needed to do about it, which was write down all the things that were like pressing me. And then really try and figure out, um, you know, just, just really have my body say, okay, yeah. mentally, you can now relax. You have now... You have now conquered the thing which you needed to conquer and now you can have a pleasant day. And the rest of the day was fine. I haven't, didn't have another anxiety attack, felt good about the day, got stuff done that I needed to get done. But it, my body was my body's way of just saying like, you had unresolved things that you needed to, needed to get at. I think that's so important because it's really you're identifying that thing 
and and I really appreciate how you broke down the way that that you're able to identify what's happening with you. Yes. Because I think sometimes we go about life so quickly that we don't really take that time to get to know ourselves and identify emotions right. or identify when something's not and like and take that moment to dig into it. Um before we go, yes. there's I, I feel called to ask you. Okay. Um to tell me about your sister who passed. So she was my oldest sister. Um, mm -hmm. She was my Libra sister. We were both born in October. So we were four years and nine days apart from each other. Um, she struggled a lot with drug addiction. She struggled mm -hmm. with alcoholism. Um, she coined herself the original party girl, you know, and then as she got older, she was, she coined herself as like the always party girl. Mm -hmm. um, she was such a sweet person. She would give, like, she didn't have much, but whatever little bit she had, she would give it to anybody who came her way. You know, if she had a dollar, she would give somebody 75 cents and keep the quarter for herself. Um, mm -hmm. she, had, she had one daughter and then she also had two grandsons who she loved dearly. She, she loved on those boys so much. Um, you know, they were so young when she passed. They remember her, but, you know, they didn't really have a chance to, to really connect with her. Like, like I feel like they shouldn't have. Um, but she was really smart. She was just a really nice, genuinely nice person um, until she started drinking. And then, like, out came, <laughs> you know, like, like, like a different personality. Um, but she really, she really had a lot of, internalized things that she hadn't dealt with from you know our, our childhood um she she just was the party girl you know she really liked to just be the center of the party attention she liked to be the person who was laughing and joking and you know just just being the the fun girl um but she really loved on her family she loved us all she was the the big protective sister she and my sister, who's the councilwoman, they were about 18 months apart. So they were more alike than the rest of us and they would fight all the time. And I would tell them all the time, y'all fight so much because you're just alike. Like you both want to be in control. Like you both want to be the, the, the older sister, but only one of you can be. <laughs> you know, it's like only one of you sisters can be the older sister. Um, so, I mean, we, we miss her so much. She died unexpectedly. And the, the thing that, that hurts me so much about the way she died was that she died alone. And, and that's mm -hmm. the part where it's just like, you know, she had, she had a boyfriend for a very long time and he went to the hospital. His body was riddled with cancer. He didn't know. He passed away. And we really felt like she, she couldn't live her life without him because they were inseparable for years. His name was Danny and they literally were like inseparable for years. So we really felt like she felt like she couldn't go on without him. Even with her grandbabies, you know, even with her daughter being here, she really just felt like she could not go forward in life without him being. She passed about a month after he did. And wow. she just she just she just had a lot of, you know, unresolved issues in her life and a lot of things that she she did was didn't feel comfortable talking about. You know, while we are a very open family and we do say things to each other. Mm -hmm. You know, I just felt like she didn't, she didn't have an opportunity to really see herself um, grow the, the way she anticipated as, as a younger woman. Um, she didn't graduate high school. She, um, you know, she, she, but she was really smart. She was really super smart. Like she used to help me all the time in school. She was really very passionate about her, her family she just loved on everybody. You know, she was constantly running around hugging people even when they wanted to get hugged. You know, she's like, come on, give me this hug, give me this kiss. And we're like, oh, like, get out of here. Um, we miss it now. You know, we, we think about her hugging and, and kissing on us now. We miss it. Um, so, and she died, uh, she died seven months shy of her 50th birthday. So oh, she wow. actually she would have been young. 50 years old. So she was actually really young. She was about four years older than me. But she was just the sweetest she really was a sweet person and she would get somebody her last. She just got caught up in drugs and alcohol, unfortunately. And, you know, she got caught up in it at a, at a young age as a teenager. And she just, she just couldn't get out of it. She just, she couldn't get out of it, but it, it didn't take away from who she was as a person. Um, it didn't take away from the fact that she loved her whole family and we loved her back. 
Um, and we just, we just miss her every day. We miss her. My mom passed away seven years ago. We, we miss her. Um, both of them died unexpectedly. Um, my mother was sick for a long time. She had a, um, she had brain aneurysms. She had uh, a kidney removed. She had a piece of her lung removed and Ooh. she had COPD at the time. So, but I know, I know from my mom that she, she got, she had gotten sick and then she had broke her leg. And she fell and broke her leg. And my mother was a walker. She would walk for miles and miles and miles. And I knew that when her quality of life diminished, where she had to be like in a walker and she couldn't walk and she had oxygen, I was like, she, she's not going to be with us long because that just wasn't her life. You know, she loved her freedom. She loved being out. She was like me. She loved talking to people. You know, we would be out and we would just be talking to folks and just all over the place. So I knew for her that, you know, once her quality of life was diminished, that that wasn't going to be, she wasn't going to be long for, for, for literally this world. And she lasted maybe eight months and then, and then she passed. That's, it sounds like both of them, just that strength, right? That strength of will. Yes. Yes. I want to still be here, you know, for the family. Mm -hmm. um, so I have, I, I have uh, some people that I love whose parents have passed and who, have struggled with, with things I think similar to what your sister struggled with. And um, one of them is, is a young boy. The other one is a grown man. He's a, you know, grown in his, in his mid to late 20s. And I pray to their spirits um, so that they can do the work that they need to do in the spirit world so that, so that their generations here, that their blood here can be healed. Yes. And I think that, um, you know, like thinking about your sister and thinking about her grandbabies and her daughter, you know, I, I with your permission, um, would like to be able to do that, to just pray for her to find that peace and to, so I, I believe that we can continue to do our work, you know, yeah, and Thank do that generational healing. Absolutely. What was, what was her name? Her name was Steve-on. Steve-on? My mother, Steve-on. My mother, I don't know Steve where she got these names from for her daughter. <laughs> so we have Yvonne, we have Rashana, Tafshir, and Kahira. Beautiful. Names that no beautiful, one... Beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. There is a, and and oh, that yeah. is beautiful. That is be as it should be. Those yeah. are her very special individual seeds. Like you, uh-uh, yes. They are. Yes, they yes. are. There are, there are none other like, like us. <laughs> there, there are no other women in the world <laughs> like us. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing yourself and sharing your family. This was amazing. You know, you know, we can talk for hours. You know, I always love yeah. talking <laughs> with you. <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. Um, but we're, but it's time to say good night. I know. I know. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you for tonight. I, I, I needed it. You know, it was, it was what I needed. Um, it's been a very long day. But I'm happy to come on here and talk with you and, and, and have everybody, you know, just share my life with everybody. Um, I'm a semi-open book. I'm not, <laughs> my daughter says I'm a little guarded, but I'm like, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm well, 47 years old, 46 years old. I mean, you know, lots of things happen in life. So but that's what makes whatever you share a gift, because when you share, you're really gifting from yourself because that's not something that you give freely. And so it is really an honor, every word that you share in your stories and the pieces of yourself. Thank you. Thank you for sharing them with us. Thank so you. we're going to say good night from here. I will see you on Wednesday. Tafshir, when is your show on? My show comes on on National Parents Union Facebook page, Tuesdays at 6 p.m. The Parent so Impact. Tomorrow, tomorrow at 6, The Parent tomorrow Impact. 6 p.m. The Parent Impact. Join us. You can... You can be with Tashfir, and then Wednesday you'll be back with me, and Friday with Anjali. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great night. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks. Bye. You are so beautiful. Thank you.